Well, it seems to me these days that you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on a television without coming up against reports of violent extremism. And I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by Mark Giuliano, Ron Haddad and Bernard Melkian. Well, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come and talk to Good us morning. today. Good morning. It's good to be here. So we're going to talk about uh, violent extremism. So let's kick off by getting a definition. What do we mean by violent extremism? So it's defined as supporting, promoting, justifying a violent or criminal act to achieve a social, economic, or religious outcome. So very often this kind of hits the news, doesn't it? You see this in the TV, it's a, it's a kind of a big story, but we, we want to talk uh, this morning about uh, community policing and how communities kind of affect on, on violent extremism. So how do we do that? How do we engage with communities to combat extremism? I, I think sometimes when, when we talk about things like violent extremism, you tend to think of it as kind of this 30,000 foot view. And the reality is that it's a group of individuals. Uh, and if you're gonna engage, you know, we use terms like engage the community, the reality is the local police officer, the local constable has to have a relationship with those people in some sense uh, that those folks are willing to provide information. It seems to me that that might be easier said than done. Sounds pretty simple, but how does that actually work on the ground? You know, it, it is a difficult chore at times, but he's absolutely right. You have to get the community involved to take a real hard stand on all crime, including violent extremism. Particularly in the immigrant communities, you cannot make them feel as though they're the enemy. And oftentimes because of you know, the uh, negative notoriety, perhaps uh, if they're first generation where they don't trust the government, the police are part of the government, you have to step over those kind of hurdles and ensure that uh, they understand they're an equal partner at the table. So it is a, a, a tougher chore, if you will. However, it's a uh, it's a task that we can't let go by because the, uh, the consequences are so great if some person chooses to harm our, our city or our country or our city block or a critical infrastructure. So, and I want to go right up front and tell you that I believe most people are not terrorists, nor will they t uh, tolerate acts of terror. So if that's the premise that I start with, then I'm going to try to convince them to be equal partners with the police department. Is this becoming a bigger issue? I don't know that it can be a bigger issue, it's a huge issue, but I feel like in Dearborn where I'm from, for example, we have the community very much engaged in crime fighting. Our last 40 major crimes, we put the, the criminals' faces on TV because we had good videos, we had people turning them in. I mean, we keep them engaged on a daily basis and uh, we did have a, uh, a gentleman that drove a PT cruiser from California to Dearborn to blow up a mosque and again he was turned in by a, a citizen store owner so you know we've really opened up the line of communications and they have to trust their police they have to have confidence in their city and when that happens the end result is a much safer and a more resilient community and I believe that's uh, you know the uh, predicament of all of uh, uh, police chiefs around the country. One of the tactics that uh, extremists use though is very often uh, uh, appealing to in a political or, or, or uh, or other type of uh, planes. How do you combat that? How do you combat it when people are talking about principles or they're talking about bigger, bigger issues? I think that you know. I think I think the point the chief makes is 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 absolutely right. I mean, I think there's this tendency to sort of try to split uh, the idea that that crime and and terrorism or extremism are somehow unrelated events. Uh, young people, uh, particularly if a community feels disaffected or disengaged from the, from the broader community around them, are probably more likely to be open to that kind of, to that kind of recruitment because the sense is what else is there. Uh, a lot of, uh, before I, uh, one of the things we do in the cops office is try to help uh, agencies across the country uh, in terms of training and technical assistance and grants to sort of expand their capacity to build those relationships. So finally, what can, the, I mean, what can the federal government do? I mean, you talked about this is something that uh, people often look at from 30,000 feet, but we talked about the importance of building communities. So what can the federal government do to help? So, so as the chief said, it's a whole of government approach. We have to support the state and local law enforcement organizations. We have to be able to support them with funding, with training, and whatever else they need to do to help reach out to the community and support their their activities, their community policing, and the bridge that they continue to build. They are the frontline uh, officers out there uh, to support them in any way we can to help them build those bridges with the community. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.